teacher for tonight. Um, and so I have no one else to introduce. Um, and you are, we're already most of us acquainted. Uh, Joel Arnold's my name, and I'm here in the Philippines. So I uh, taught theology and mostly biblical theology and systematic theology, but in the past Greek and church history and a number of different things. So that's about enough introduction, introduction for myself. Um, tonight, what we're looking forward to doing is launching into a history of apologetics. And the process of getting the class ready for tonight has been fun. It's been kind of exhausting, but it's been engaging for me, kind of opened up my mind to another whole arena of things that I had not gotten into before. Um, so looking forward to introducing that to us in just a moment. And maybe what I'll do, I'll ask Pastor Halarsis if you're willing to open us in prayer. And then from there, we will, uh, we will launch in. We are very much thankful, Lord God, for tonight, for giving us another opportunity to study the Word. And we are also thankful for our teachers who are uh, giving us time to teach us, O oh Lord. And we pray that as we study, Lord oh God, the lesson that we have, we value it and uh, we can use it in our ministry. Lord God, we are praying that the Holy Spirit may move upon us tonight and give us the understanding to understand what the, the lessons we have tonight. Help us, O Lord, and be with us in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, sir. Very good. Um, let me ask one, just as we're getting started, a couple of things that we'll do here to get us going. I want to explain one thing that I've not done yet because we've had other teachers and I wanted to use the time well. But let me ask you, if you're able, uh, just a recommendation or a request here. So uh, we've done this before. We've asked if you're able to turn on your camera um, that you would, if you're willing to consider that. And here's the reason. I just want you to understand the rationale for it. Um, two things. <laughs> I've sat on both sides of the equation, and uh, part of the disadvantage of online education is the anonymity. And so, um, you know, the advantage naturally is that you don't have to travel into a school. The disadvantage is because you're behind a camera, then um, there's just there's that much more of a divide um, and I find very much for myself that if I have my camera on it turns this into not my just watching like I, the way I would watch a video but it actually turns it into interaction so that I am part of the equation it turns it into more of a classroom so there's a benefit if I'm speaking of myself as the student if I'm sitting in on like Dr. Riley's lecture and my camera is on um, I'm interacting with them as a person, if that makes sense. Um, and it's not just a flat screen. So that, and that, as a side note, that's one reason I strongly encourage students who are taking to also take it live, watch live, if you possibly can. Uh, we get some good interaction going on in the chat. It helps us. And um, it just, for me, it just makes a huge difference. It's, it's more like a classroom versus just watching video. You, know, you can watch YouTube videos all day long. Uh, different people that have done things, but here's something that's a little different. Okay, one other piece of it though is um, as a teacher, I will say, and maybe we should just you know, open it up and let people try it sometime. It is tremendously easier to talk to humans instead of little black boxes with names on them. Tremendously different. Uh, and it makes all the difference in the world. Even, you know, feedback when I'm, when I'm teaching in the physical space, um, it makes all the difference in the world to watch my students. And if they're seeing something, if they're getting something, I, I'm reacting accordingly. So it's a critical part of teaching. Well, here in the online space, it's just a help to me. If I'm able to see faces, help the other teachers, it makes it, um, it's gonna make it a better experience for you <laughs> because we have also the, the ability to interact with you and so forth. Okay, um, and I'm just glancing here. Uh, I understand in some cases, you may not have, you know, your camera may not be working or there's all kinds of other reasons. And there's times when I've switched it off because 
kids are playing in the background or whatever. So I understand all those realities. This is just a suggestion or a request. Okay, um, I am going to pause there and later on I'm gonna come back. I wanna talk about logisticals of the class, but I'm gonna do that later on today. As more people are coming in, that'll make sense, I think. Um, what I wanna do right now is introduce us briefly to where we are in the class overall and where things are going. Okay, so um, we are at kind of an inflection point, a bit of an inflection point anyway, in the progress of our class. We have, have had this set up so that we are in kind of two halves. The first half was or is talking us through the kind of, uh, we'll say the philosophy of apologetics. So I called this foundations. And this was introduction to the discipline, theological foundations, religious epistemology and approach to po apologetics. And today, history of apologetics. Um, so this is the kind of the, the foundational and the core concepts that one ought to know in order to do apologetics well. Now that transitions us after this lecture into a, a next uh, series of things. Actually, this right here is a mistake. This should be down in the next group um, because the next group now are going to take us into applied apologetics. One of those that we'll talk about as we have time next time, Thursday, is the question of damnation and the unevangelized. It's a really thorny problem. A person who never heard the gospel, is that person going to be redeemed or not? I mean, this is a very difficult problem for apologetics. I would say particularly if you're living outside of the West, then a person can throw the charge in your face. Hey, my ancestors never had the opportunity to hear the gospel. And so you as a Westerner, um, and the answer underneath that is, you know, even in the West, my ancestors didn't hear the gospel until much later as well. But it's a, it's a struggle for all of us, right? So how do you deal with this? Um, that's a question we'll talk about as well as issues of bibliology, creation. I'm very excited here. I've got... Um, it's a young earth creationist a guy. That, this is his field. I mean, he has a PhD in entomology uh, and works in this field all the time that we're looking forward to hearing from him. Uh, also an excellent teacher here on Buddhism and Hinduism. It's going to be a very, very high quality lecture. Uh, that's just come together recently here as well. A converted Catholic uh, with some just some great credentials. Following from there, Islam, postmodernism, religious pluralism, miracles in the resurrection, practical use of apologetics. And my final, our final lecture here, I just want to toss this out here, and this is why I'm showing you some of these. Um, the final lecture is student questions. We've done this for every other class. And so as you have questions, in fact, I need to get it up. I need to get the forum up. But as you have questions, uh, that's your place to drop them. And then that becomes the basis for the, the whole last lecture. We're just, uh, we'll just lecture through. Sometimes I've brought other guys in, but I'll be answering your specific questions. So as things come up, make a note, drop that in the forum and save those because that becomes the core of the lecture. Okay, so this is why I say it's, it's an inflection point because if this is the foundations, this is more the philosophical side, then this is the applied. And so now what we're talking about is how to actually use it. And uh, that's applied in various issues. That come up. Okay, um, and that's where then things stand up to this point. So this is kind of our last foundational. I'll probably end up using some of next time to go through a little bit more information for us to, to grasp some of these things. Okay, and then that takes me into what I want to talk about today, which is talking about history of apologetics. Um, for the discussion of, for this topic, uh, the history of apologetics source that I'm using is really the only source that's out there as a major source. I gave you an article that I found that I, I thought was quite good. Um, the source that is used as kind of the textbook is by Avery Cardinal Dulles. Um, and Cardinal, uh, he's a Roman Catholic Cardinal. So um, this, is, this is what's there. I mean, this is really what exists. And if you're taking an apologetics doctoral level course somewhere, and you're going to work through history of apologetics, this is the source that you'll go to. Uh, it's $25 um, and it's about 500 pages. Uh, it was helpful as a textbook type resource on the history of apologetics, but he's Catholic. Um, by the way, that last name Dulles, if you've ever flown in and out of Dulles Airport in Washington, DC, this is his, his dad is the airport guy. Um, and then Avery it became a, a Roman Catholic cardinal. Um, so as he's going through, he's going to give a lot of discussion of both Protestant and Catholic apologetics. They're put in there together. In some of the early period, that's less of a difference. As you get later, it gets less helpful. Um, 
I would say it's a pretty boring book. And so if I wasn't right, if I wasn't doing this, this lecture, I would not have read it. And so I would not say go buy it and read it. It was kind of boring. Um, but I learned some things from it. It was a slog, but I, I'm glad that I got through it. And uh, the process, I think, of looking through the history of apologetics has helped me process some things about apologetics. Okay, um, here's what I'll do for starters. I'm going to throw something at you. We did last time church history, and we talked about some of the roles of church history and functions, why it's a benefit. Um, give me a, just your your first thought, what would be the, what, what things do you think you would benefit from thinking through the history of apologetics? Like why give a lecture on it? Uh, why donate two hours of your short life? Or in my case, 500 pages of painful reading to talk about the history of apologetics. Um, what, what's going to be the benefit? Okay, give me some thoughts in the chat or what would you expect to happen? What would you hope to happen thinking about the history of apologetics? Off to a slow start, I see. Um, okay, good. Bringing me many things chronologically into perspective. This happened for me. Um, my my background in church history is not as strong as my background in other parts. Uh, you know, biblical theology, systematic theology, exegesis. I feel really comfortable. I love that. Um, so the process of, in my case, slogging through the history helped me get a big picture again. And so that's good. I have another article I can give you. Um, I'll try to scan that in. I'll try to scan that in and get that up on the Moodle page. Um, and it's another good overview. It's like a three, four page overview. Um, so yeah, I mean, there's a real benefit in doing that. Okay. When uh, avoid reinventing the wheel, it's good. Um, and th this concept, you know, by the time that you are doing apologetics, somebody else, we, if we were at the early church, then yeah, you might, you might really be the first person to think, think through something. But at 2,000 years out, um, somebody has probably articulated this already. Chances are better than you can, better than I can. And so um, it's a good idea to go find somebody else's resources. There's, uh, there's several major figures. One of them is Paley, you may have heard of. Uh, he's one of the fathers of evidentialism, one of the approaches. And um, Paley, basically, he doesn't come up with much new. He basically takes other people's arguments, puts them together, creates a resource, and it's incredibly influential, stretching across you know, 100 plus years, uh, still useful today. So this is real, right? Get other people's uh, benefits. Learning from other experience, learning their arguments, good. Um, developing one error to another, dealing with different issues, good. Here's some of the things I, well, just thoughts, I'll, I'll toss out there. Um, if you, you know, you grew up in a, what you grew up in a culture, okay, you have an opportunity to leave and go to another culture and you live, you interact with another group of people with different sets of values and different ways of thinking about things. One of the things that happens in that early contextualization enculturation process is that you realize some of the things you always assumed were givens, this is the way life works and it has to be this way. Um, they're not. And so other people can do it differently. And they might take the way you've thought about life and turn it completely on its head. And at first you go, that makes no sense. And you, after a while, look at it and you realize there is a little bit of, there's some rationale and they're onto something. And, um, and that's the process with enculturation. Okay. But there's a benefit, I think, in traveling and seeing another viewpoint because it corrects your own. And you realize that the narrowness of your own viewpoint um, there, there might be a bigger world out there. Okay. History is a form of travel. History is the opportunity to go see other places, other contexts, other challenges, and see how they handled them. And particularly in apologetics, what you end up discovering now is other problems and other concerns that people had to manage. And in the process, it shines a light back on your own, okay? Because you realize that some of the mistakes they made, some of the things they did that seem really weird, awkward, why did you do that? That was a terrible choice you realize that we do it in our own way. See? And it ends up bringing lessons back on us to help us be more careful. So I think this can be very profoundly, I hope, very profoundly helpful for us just processing. Um, and then I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna go really far into this, um, but let me say something about Dulles or as a way of introdu 
introducing into this. The first era that we're going to talk about is biblical and New Testament apologetics. That's part of the history, right? If you're going to do a history of the church, you really start with the apostles. Um, and Dulles does not do a good job with the apostles. And some of that has to do with his liberalism. Uh, so as we go forward, I'll show you multiple places where Dulles will say, this apologist spoke this way, and yet he was foolish because he assumed that Moses actually wrote the New Testament, uh, the Old Testament, Old Testament books, and so forth. Um, you know, the Pentateuch actually assumed that he was the author. So Dulles is coming from a, a rather liberal, liberal viewpoint. Well, the same is true when it comes to his first chapter, his first section, New Testament apologetics, which is uh, unfortunate, Sion, because there's a lot here that would massively help us and help him think through apologetics in a more appropriate way. One of the assignments I'm going to give you for our next class, I want you in a forum type of format, I want you to just give me biblical apologetics, any example that comes to your mind, okay? And I'm really throwing that out there very broad. But if you just give me verses, passages, examples, okay? And by this one, I really, I really do mean broad um, for instance, here's an example, one that I put down, Joshua 21, 43 to 45. The Lord gave to Israel all the land that he swore. This is at the end, 24, right? End of Joshua. Thus the Lord gave to Israel all the land that he swore to give their fathers. They took possession. They settled. The Lord gave them rest on every side, just as he had sworn to their fathers. Not one of their enemies had withstood them. The Lord had given all their enemies into their hands. Not one word of all the good promises that the Lord had made to the house of Israel had failed. All came to pass. And if you think about that, what I just read, um, that's an apologetic because part of what he's doing is it's fitting in with certainly the Pentateuch and the promises of the Pentateuch in a way of saying everything that God had promised to do, he did. And since he'd fulfilled what he had promised to do, he prom fulfilled his word then we're very much seeing that God is a covenant keeping God. See? And so Joshua 20, 21 becomes an apologetic. It's an argument. God keeps his promises. See, look, he fulfilled. It's an argument from history. So I will, I'm contending just as a start that the core of the history of apologetics, starting with scripture, a foundation is to say scripture is absolutely full of apologetics. And I've got, I don't know, uh, maybe 30 points here. And there's a bunch more of places where I'm just pulling out passages that are apologetic in nature, okay? Sometimes a whole book has an apologetic tone to it. So I will talk about this assignment or remind you later, but your assignment for next class will be that. Think through and come up with as many passages as come to your mind. Where is scripture arguing apologetically? But to be more specific on that, I'm gonna skip way ahead to Acts. And I'm doing this because I, well, I want you to do so, uh, some of the thinking trying to come up with passages. Uh, but I'm, I'm also very interested in the kerygma. And if you're familiar with this, the kerygma is the preaching of the apostles. So in the preaching of the apostles, we're finding um, endless numbers of places, sermons, I say endless, it's not endless, but it's a lot where an apostle is preaching and the style of how he argues or the style of how he communicates is deeply apologetic in tone. Okay, I want us to look at the, uh, just one example. So we're gonna go to Acts 3, 12 to 26. And I'll pop that up for us here, just a second. Um, okay. So uh, Acts 3, 12 to 26, this is where they've just performed a healing. And so in, you know, in response then, um, the people are gathering around and they're amazed at what's happened. Okay. So Peter addresses the people, many of Israel, men of Israel, why do you wonder at this? Or why do you stare at us as though by our own power or piety, we have made him walk the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, the God of our fathers glorified his servant, Jesus, whom you delivered and over and denied in the presence of Pilate when he had decided to release him. You denied the holy and righteous one, asked for a murder to be granted to you. You killed the author of life whom God raised from the dead. And to this we are witnesses. His name, by faith in his name, has made this man strong whom you see and know. And the faith that is through Jesus has given this man perfect health in the presence of all. The argument that follows is going to be deeply rooted in an argument from prophecy. And so he's saying everything that God had foretold by the prophets, he has fulfilled. So we're now seeing then, based on what, what happened, the death of Christ, the fulfillment of prophecy. God said he would raise up a prophet like me from your brothers. 
And so it shall be, it's clear that Jesus is the one. You are the sons of the prophets of the covenant that God made with your father, saying to Abraham, in your offspring shall all the families of the earth be blessed. And God has sent him to you first to bless you. Okay, the reason this is uh, relevant to me or in my, my viewpoint, as far as our thinking about it, I think what I'm looking at here, if you follow the apologetic that Peter just made, what I'm looking at here is something that is profoundly and deeply Jewish in tone, okay? And what I did here, this is just in my own highlighting of it. Uh, if you scan down through, you see the blue, okay? The blue, uh, which some of the lines got messed up here, but the blue is representing the Jewish tone, okay? Prophets, prophets, the covenant, the offspring, Abraham, the covenant, even servant, raised up his servant, that's an Isianic servant, right? My servant, that idea. Even here from Samuel, those who came after him, all of these things God prophesied. In other words, you, you can't go too far looking at this passage to recognize how profoundly Jewish, or let's say how profoundly rooted in the Old Testament Paul's apologetic is. And so when he's speaking to a Jewish audience, he's speaking to them in profoundly Jewish ways. Okay, now let's do that in comparison. Let's jump to Acts 14. Um, and I'll put that up again here as well, or feel free to turn. Uh, Acts 14, verse 15, now he's speaking to a Gentile audience. Men, why are you doing this? We also are, of, are men of like nature with you. We bring you good, not, good news that you should turn from these vain things to a living God who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. In past generations, he allowed all the nations to walk in their own ways, yet he did not leave himself without witness. He did good by giving you rains from heaven, fruitful seasons, satisfying your hearts with food and gladness. And a little bit later, if you just go to the next chapter, actually, it, it, it extends even further, or excuse me, I say the next chapter, chapter 17. Um, this is the altar to the unknown God. And so chapter 17 verse 22 he's going to actually pick up what they're doing the unknown god what you worship as unknown i proclaim to you the god who made the world the lord of heaven and earth and so as creator that's kind of a foundation as sustainer of the earth he gives himself to all mankind he gives life and breath and everything he's the maker of mankind he's allotted their places and then he's going to quote two poets of their of their own culture okay so even if your own poets have said in him we live and move and have our being, which is, this is a quotation from a philosopher that if you study a history of philosophy, he'll pop up in the history of philosophy. Okay, and so what you're getting here between Paul's Jewish presentation and his presentation to Greeks, it's profoundly different. Okay. Now, here's the thing that's striking, though. I'm, I'm, putting, I'm gonna put it back up. Uh, notice the last phrase here. The times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. Of this, he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. And here's what I think is striking. So the Jewish mode, if you want to say that, of Paul's apologetic versus the Gentile mode of Paul's apologetic is profoundly different. Where he comes in speaking to Jews and he's speaking from a deeply Jewish background, and he's citing Old Testament prophecy, and he's linking it in, okay, in profound ways. And then when I jump over here, Gentile, now he's citing philosophers. He's doing a very different thing, but he ends in the same place. And the core of the apologetic, you realize, though the expression of it is very different, profoundly different, the core of the apologetic, of the apologetic is the same. It comes down to this, Jesus Christ, rose from the dead, he's judging the world, repent. And both apologetics end in the same place. I think that's really profound. Because what you get from that is that apologetic has in its essence a, a phase, a mode where you are having to be adapting and another mode where you refuse to adapt at all. And so a successful apologetic has to avoid both extremes. You cannot just bake your apologetic or you cannot bake your presentation of the gospel. We defined apologetic so broadly in our first lecture, even including any presentation of the gospel. You cannot just bake it in a way that says, this is the way it is and I present the same to every single person. That's a failure. Adjust, be aware, know your audience 
and, and actually your apologetic on day one and day two might be so different that at least the first part of the presentation, people might not even think you're talking about the same thing initially. Okay, but on the other hand, the core of your apologetic stays so absolutely unchanged that it always has the same ending place, right? That, when, that, that at the center of it, you don't adjust that at all. And the reason I think this is so apropos, it's so appropriate to what we're discussing tonight is because we're going to see in the, the post New Testament history of apologetics, we're going to see the constant tension between people taking their apologetic and so conforming it to the thought of their context that they actually destroy Christianity. And so they're, they're deeply concerned to try to make Christianity sound platonic. They want to make Christianity fit Aristotle, and they work really hard to do it. Versus people who speak right past other people and aren't communicating successfully. The New Testament itself is giving us a core foundation, right, of both of these, these things in tension. One other comment uh, about the New Testament apologetic or New Testament history that I think is very striking. If you go through the kerygma, uh, and this is also part of, part of what I want to give you. Um, if you go through the kerygma, the preaching of the apostles, you should be struck by how deeply connected it is consistently to the resurrection, death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, especially the resurrection. Um, if you think about what I just read, it ended down with the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Basically, every one of the, of the, the kerygma passages ends that way. And there are other elements in the Kerygma passage. Uh, these elements, the recurring things, the kingdom has come, God's sovereignty, the resurrection, the coming judgment, the apostles as witnesses, we are witnesses. Those are four big elements that come up constantly. And I'm dropping into the chat box. There is the list of all the Kerygma passages. So um, just an idea, if you wanted to, for your devotions <laughs> for the next week, you could try that. And I think you'll get a blessing from it. Reading through the Kerygma passages is phenomenal. Uh, and they will devotions even read through those and look for themes. What are the big recurring ideas in the Kerygma passages? And I think you'll love it. It's, it's, it's fabulous. Okay. But the recurring theme of the resurrection of Jesus Christ gives us this apologetics, unfortunately can break down to the point that Jesus Christ becomes a passing footnote. Okay. One of the apologists, apologists I survey here as we have time, um, goes and builds his entire apologetic, like a four volume work. And he mentions Jesus in one section on his way to discussing the clergy. Okay. And that's the essence of a failed apologetic, right? It's completely failed if Jesus and more specifically the resurrection is not in it. You have to have those things. There is no other option. Okay, so that gives us one other keynote. And then a final keynote that I'll give from the New Testament era just as a theme is to say um, that your apologetic is not necessarily, the success of your apologetic is not necessarily measured by the results. Sometimes a good apologetic leads people into sharp rejection, okay? And this is why I say this here in the passage we just looked at. It ended with, he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. He has given assurance by raising him from the dead. So, verse 32, when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked. Now, others said, we will hear you again about this. Some men joined and believed, and there were people, so there was success. But, you know, the, the interesting thing here is the point about the resurrection of the dead was not popular. And, and given probably a Platonic background that they're assuming, we're assuming here, not sure entirely what, what is the mindset that's invoked, but people clearly are rejecting, uh, rejecting the resurrection. I think Paul knows that if he's quoting their poets and he's crafting this apologetic so successfully, he knows they're going to reject the resurrection. And the temptation then as, a, as an apologist would be to skip that part or minimize it. And I want to argue that a successful apologetic sometimes takes the thing that people are going to most hate and puts it front and center, right? They're going to reject this. They're going to reject it because it confronts their unbelief. There it is, right? There's a time when you just have to put it right in front of somebody. And this is another part of the tension here. Our struggle or our temptation is to recreate our presentation to make it acceptable. 
Okay. But a good apologetic might actually craft it in such a way that on some points you're removing their invalid concerns, right? You're removing things that they think are problems with Christianity and they aren't. And there are other times when you come in and you know they're going to hate this one and you say it like right up. Okay. And both of those things, the choice to pull something back because you know they'll misunderstand it and the choice to put something front and center because it's the thing that must, must rebuke their fallenness. Both of those things are part of the apologetic urge. It's part of the responsibility of, uh, of an appropriate apologist. Um, an example, just so I'm clear on this, an example of what I mean, something that might be confusing. Uh, you know, for a lot of people in our era will go around with the assumption that the New Testament documents are a mess. They were just kind of pulled together, over the, you know, maybe last 500 years or so. Okay, well, it's good, I think, to help them realize, hey, these documents have great support. So that's an example of something that you go ahead and pull off the table. They're wrong about that. Help them realize that that's. But when it comes to something else, let's say the exclusivity of Jesus' claims, don't downplay it. Don't try to pretend that Jesus is willing to share the stage, right? You put it right in. Jesus said, I'm the way. End of discussion, right? And there's no, there's no excuse for downplaying or trying to remove that, get that off the table. You put it right up in front. Okay, um, that is all I want to do as far as the New Testament era. Um, I have some things here that I will, I say that's all I have to do, some things here that I'll just run through as summaries or um, just processing that a bit. Okay, so thinking about the New Testament era, what's going on in the ap apostolic era? First, major opponents. Certainly the Jewish establishment. Pay attention to the book of Acts and the flow of the book of Acts. Um, at the beginning of the book, you have a much more positive response from the Jewish establishment. And then Acts has this, this shape to it. And the further you go out, the Jewish, the Jewish response is getting more and more negative and the Gentile response is getting, getting more and more positive, which ties into some things we don't pay attention to enough in Romans and in Ephesians. The fact that in the early have crossing the people you expected the Jews are rejecting but the people that you least expected the Gentiles are opening up in wide open arms uh, also sheer ignorance um, people that just have no idea what this Christianity is and doctor, doctrinal innovation and that you're seeing like in Colossians uh, second Peter the Revelation 2 and 3 the seven churches okay special challenges that were true for the apostolic era no two New Testament documents if you think about it I mean Okay, as you get later in the era, they're maybe going to have access to some, okay, but they don't, they certainly don't have many of the New Testament documents, particularly in the early part, because they're just not written yet. So the documents are still being written. Confusion about the Gentile question, I say that because of Acts 15, if you look at what's happening, and even Peter and, and Acts 11, Peter himself is confused. How do I view these Gentiles who want to come in and join the church? So even the apostles are not clear. Advantages, I, I just put this because it's, it's it, but in Acts, theologically, the spirit is driving everything. Living eyewitnesses who remembered the events. I don't just mean the apostles. I mean people out there, the people they're speaking to, so that some of their apologetic goes something like, you know, you remember, you did this, right? And that's powerful, chapter two and three. You killed the Messiah, right? It's very powerful, but they are actually talking to people in some cases that were there. The authority of the apostles is a real thing. I mean, who speaks with authority like Peter and Paul? Though the comment I made, or just the qualification here is, the documents we hold are a much better word of prophecy. So I don't want to overstate that. Apologetic themes in the apost apostolic, apologetic, the kerygma, the kingdom, God's sovereign plan, Jesus' death and resurrection, the coming judgment, and the apostles as witnesses. These are repeated themes. All of this I'm, I'm planning to give to you after the lecture is done. Okay, uh, that's New Testament era. Any questions or comments before I keep on rolling? Next, we'll move on to the patristic era. So the church fathers. Um, and good, very, very good. Uh, arguments against the canned approaches that don't approach the charismatic. Um, so good. Okay. Um, all right, I'll keep on going to the patristic era. And if you have comments, just drop them in. So um, we're talking now about media, immediately after the apostles. And so the first centuries of the church, the very early fathers of the church, the earliest fathers, as in 
uh, Clement of Rome, Ignatius of Antioch, Polycarp. We have very little recorded apologetics from these men. And um, we don't, some of that is just we don't have as much recorded from them. Uh, we may have a letter or two. Uh, we may have words that are passed down. This person recorded what that person said, those kinds of things. So in many cases, we just don't have much from them. Really where we start to get stuff is from the fathers after about 125, 125 AD or so. And uh, at that point, writers are starting to articulate. In fact, I can, let me put some of this, uh, this might make us, I'll help us follow a little bit. I'll put this on. Um, for us to follow along. Writers are starting to articulate responses to um, the different challenges that they're facing. These groups in particular, four main groups, new converts, philosophers, emperors, and Jews. Um, and Dulles has, I think, a helpful display of this. I, I, this is not, he doesn't have, this is a chart, put into chart form. Um, and, and this, I think, summarizes it after AD 125. So here on, on the left side, the apologists, you find them asking for civil toleration. It's a political problem. And it's the reality that within the Roman Empire, they're being persecuted and they're being killed. Okay? And so they're going in and they're, they're making arguments to say, we're not, these, these rumors that have been said about us are not true. Okay? So don't kill us. On the other side, the religious side, seeking new converts, two things, addressing paganism. So they're competing against, if you want to say, the Greek and Roman gods, uh, mystery cults other forms of paganism, and in particular, addressing Judaism. And this is a huge thing, massive thing in the, the fathers. So all of those themes, really basically three different forms, political, civil toleration, addressing paganism, and addressing Judaism are coming up regularly in the fathers. Um, and as a, just a starting point for that, the Judaism side of this, I think this is fascinating. This, when I say Philo, Philo is not a Christian. Uh, he's writing as a Jew, and he's an apologist, basically. Think of him as a Jewish apologist. Okay. And he's before the church is articulating his, their apologetics. But Philo had this program, this um, really philosophical program. As close as possible to Judaism. Okay. And the idea goes something like this. If, if you want to put this in today's terms, um, someone who wants to say, you ought to believe Christianity because Christianity has so much scientific wisdom in it. Okay. Why would you do that? Because this is kind of the reigning framework of our day. And so to say that it's a, you know, Christianity is so scientifically correct ends up being this more or less argument to say, it's a good thing and it's worth believing because of it fits with the thinking of our day. Well, the thinking of the day for Philo is the Greek philosophers. Okay, Plato, Aristotle, Socrates, other Greek philosophers. So his best argument, he feels anyway, for Judaism is to try to convince people that Judaism is really a lot like the Greek philosophers. That's the whole mode of this apologetic. And what I thought was fascinating from this is three different methods that he used to that. Number one, he argued that the Greek philosophers actually depended on Moses and stole their ideas from him. You like Plato, Plato you like Aristotle, but they <laughs> they actually got it from Moses. Hebrew wisdom is more ancient than the Greeks. So Moses simply came to these insights first. You know, Moses got there first. Eventually the Greeks got around to it, but we were there first. And philosophy was God's gift to the Greeks, but the Jews received the same wisdom more directly from God by revelation. Okay. Now here's the irony of this. And the reason I give you, this is Jewish apologetics, not Christian. Um, the reason I give you this is this becomes a pattern that the early church is gonna turn around and we're gonna see it in just a second. They turn around and they start trying to do the exact same thing with Christianity, right? So let's jump here, Justin Martyr. Oops, I just lost my window. Um, uh, let me get back up. Okay, Justin Martyr, one of the first apologists that we have extensive records of anyway. Justin Martyr, most important second century apologist. He's writing to the emperors and he's arguing for toleration for Christians. And so his argument is don't kill us because we're not as bad as uh, people say we are. In his second apology, he tries to show that Christians have discovered the same insights as philosophy. Because of revelation, our insights are better. The philosophers were enlightened by the divine logos and they were, get this, they were Christians without realizing it. Okay? And so the, the reasoning goes, 
the same wisdom stretches across the ages, both for philosophers and for us. We're, ours is better. But the philosophers were Christians, they just didn't realize it. Um, and as a supporting piece of that here, uh, he's also going to argue, and this is a more legitimate argument, that Christians are not destructive. Um, the, the, the theories or the rumors that are going around are that Christians are doing wicked things. And he's saying, really, we're not hurting your society. So why kill us? Right? We're good people. We're productive people. We help the economy. Don't kill us. And a similar thing is happening here with Athenagoras. Um, he's answering two charges. He's answering the charge that they are atheists, and he's answering immorality. One of the things that was said is that Christians were involved, that, that they ate babies, that they were involved in orgies. And so the early apologists are trying to answer that. No, we don't do that. Um, really beautiful in the letter to Diognetus. Uh, why would Christians lead, or why would Christianity lead people to reject pagan gods and Jewish beliefs? Why, you know, why would they make that sacrifice? Because, and this is, this is good, Christians are a new race. Christians are everywhere at home and everywhere strangers. That's good theology. Okay. Um, and here is an, a fascinating argument that we'll talk about in just a second. The secret of believers' love for each other is this recurring theme in this period. So that when you pay attention carefully to what's happening with these early apologists, they can say something like, you know our reputation. And our reputation is good. We love each other and you see our kindness to each other and we share things in common. I think one of the wording is Christians share everything in common except their wives is one of the apologists' words. And so that demonstrates something about the reality. Um, I think that's, I'll pause for a second with this, but I, I think that's partially a, a good challenge to us as we think about our own apologetic. I would hope that uh, we could point to the church as a positive apologetic. Pointing to the church or our individual churches anyway would be part of contributing to the believability of Christianity and not negative. And then finally, here's an issue that comes up during the era. Why did the religion appear so late in the world history, in the history of the world? I think this is neat, and I included this here in the notes, just a summary point. Um, it's neat because, or it's, it's fascinating because it, you recognize, even at this time, people are assuming that they're at the end of the world. Um, and so the charge here is, you know, if Jesus is the Messiah, it doesn't make sense that like all of human history has gone by and then at the very end, the Messiah comes. See, well, we don't look at it that way. We look at Jesus coming at roughly the middle because from our standpoint, it looks that way. Uh, but recognizing that different time periods are de dealing with a different, different issue there. Okay, um, general observations. And we have it here, or I'll just hop over and actually put it uh, in another form here. So this is to summarize the patristic era and some of the things that they're struggling with. Uh, major opponents, I mentioned this are already, but three, political persecution, asking for civil toleration. So, I mean, there's, there's recurring the massive numbers, numbers of persecutions that are have, happening within Rome. Judaism, the problem here is distinguishing themselves. Uh, the Roman government is going to initially view Christianity as a kind of a knockoff Judaism, uh, like a sect of Jews. And so they're trying to demonstrate that they are actually different. Jesus is the Messiah, as well as addressing Judaism itself. And then paganism. Um, the problem that you see recurring as a pattern here is that from the standpoint of the Roman establishment, they look at, these are our traditional ways, our patriotic ways. And so you're basically abandoning the proven patriotic ways. Um, and so this is viewed as very, of course, a very negative thing. Special challenges that they face in this era. And I'll, I'll do this and then we'll continue on with some third century guys. Uh, but the first is this complete ignorance of Christianity. Um, and what I mean by that is in the era, okay, uh, people have no idea what you're talking about when you say Christian. So you toss that out there and it's completely confusing to people. And a supporting concept behind that then uh, becomes this. People assume that they were just a Jewish cult. There are these scurrilous rumors that they eat babies, that there's orgies. And then this is real. People view them as anti-patriotic because you're against the traditional culture and the gods. Okay? So you can hit this, let's say, um, you know, certain parts of the world today, Poland, uh, have a little bit here maybe. People are thinking, Philippines, I mean. 
people were thinking, you know, okay, if to be to authentically Polish is to be Catholic, to be authentically Irish is to be Catholic. And so to not be Catholic is to reject your roots, right? Um, and that's, that's probably what we're dealing with the, in the early patristic era. Okay, no historical precedence. I think this is a big deal. As the first generation, no one has explored the options. No one has codified theology. And so nobody has figured out the good and the bad things to do. And yet they're not apostles. See, Peter and Paul write with apostolic authority. Okay, but Justin Martyr, no, nobody has ever codified an apologetic before. And so for Justin Martyr then to make some of these arguments, he, he steps in some potholes. But, you know, I have the advantage of read, reading Avery Cardinal Dulles and seeing the potholes that came before. Justin doesn't get that, right? He's the first one. Recognize most writers don't even have access to the complete canon of scripture. Okay, so they probably only have a few of the books. Nearly every mar argument must be completely original. Even the framing of an argument, if you say to me, uh, you know, a, a theodicy, a defense of the goodness of God against the problem of evil, I go and I find other guys who have done it and I borrow their brains. But everything is new. It's all original. And so it's going to be framed that way. Other challenges. Um, this question I asked earlier, why did the Messiah come only at the end of the world? That's something that they uniquely had to deal with. And then the practical realities of fleeing persecution, um, you don't have, it, 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 say this, it's hard to develop a good apologetic and do good scholarly work when you're just trying to stay alive. Right? And so running around trying to escape persecution is a real part of this. Later, the rapid move to the political center. And that takes me back. Let's jump back over um, and poke along a little further with, poke along, I'm sorry, push along a little further with the notes. Um, in, in other pieces of what's happening here. Okay, so I offer those as uh, general observations. I'm skipping some other things, but I'll, I'll keep on moving. Uh, the Alexandrians. Alexandrians, very different, far more sophisticated, far more polished. By the time you get to the Alexandrians, they are going beyond just making defenses. You get the incense, Justin and, and the early apologists are just trying to, to push off the immediate attacks. And by the time you get to the Alexandrians, you get the sense that they are actually turning it around and they're actually fighting back. In other words, it's not just defensive, but it's offensive. See this uh, Clement is calling people to conversion. So surveying Creek philosophy and the other cults, he presents Christ as the supreme teacher of wisdom, transcending the value of them all. This is a little awkward though, because he parallels, here's the wisdom cults and here's their teacher kind of, okay, Platonism, Plato speaks wise, spoke wisely, right? Good, very good, okay. But Jesus is the supreme teacher for art. In other words, it's set up as a parallel. As Plato taught them, Jesus teaches us. It's awkward. Uh, the Greeks had wisdom, but they did not follow through since they didn't know the word himself, Jesus. And even more awkward here, Christ is the new Orpheus taming the souls of savage men. Like Dionysus, Dionysus, Dionysius, Christ is the true hierophant, is like the priest teacher, offering mankind knowledge of the true mysteries. In other words, what you're getting, the, uh, the, the Alexandrians are writing with a much higher level of sophistication. And so they pull in all kinds of literary allusions and they pull in philosophy and stuff like that. But the very sophistication of their argument means that in the process they distort. And so they take Christianity and try to make it sound more literary and more sophisticated and incorporating more of philosophy to make it work for them. Uh, even worse is Origen, and Origen has all kinds of other issues. Um, but he's going to do some arguments that we would recognize. Here, this argument sounds like something we would use today. The resurrection is defensible because the disciples risk their lives. And so you wouldn't have risked your life if you knew you were making it up. That's the argument. And you can't say it was just a hallucination because lots of people saw it. Um, this, is a, this is a neat argument. The evidence of the church of Jesus are the churches themselves, fulfilled prophecies, ongoing miracles, the wisdom in Christ, the wisdom and morals of Jesus' followers, and the extraordinary spread of Christianity. That list, okay, this is really early. Uh, dates on origin, 184 to 253. This is really early. Okay, feasibly, when Origen is born, people are just passing away that were born around the time of the death of John. So it's like one generation, okay? So, you know, feasibly, you can know people who knew people who knew people who knew John, okay? Just go back a couple of, 
uh, you know, two stages and you can, you can get to John, the apostle himself. But this argument already is one that's going to carry all the way down into the late period. You're going to have people doing this in the 19th century, that list. I mean, it's the same list. So this is really striking. In Dulles comments, he's perhaps the first apologist who seemed prepared to take on any objection that could possibly be urged against the Christian faith, whether from the standpoint of history, philosophy, or of the natural sciences. He wrote basic, if you want to think of it like an, a dictionary of apologetics, you know, it's a, it's a whole set of all of the different charges that were made, and he's answering each one of them. And that's, that's a profound step forward. Um, apologetics has reached a high watermark in him. The Latin apologists, apologists uh, mostly coming from a, the background of law, where if you want to think the Alexandrians, literary, philosophy, Latin, they're going, these guys are going more with, they're more like lawyers, this is their background. And they're going to do some things here that are unfortunate. Uh, the best philosophers agree with Christians about the nature of, the God, of God. The best philosophers, I mean, this is a theme that's going to happen. The best philosophers were actually Christians. And Christians today, he's going to, Marcus uh, Felix is going to say, Christians are the, the philosophers of today. He never quotes the Bible. He never quotes or explains Christianity in any clarity. Dulles comments that it seems that he may not have understood Christianity very well. Um, so this is all definitely very negative. Tertullian um, is, a, I guess, a bit of a breath of fresh air. There's some positives here. And there's some neat stuff with Tertullian. Uh, pause for a second here. Tertullian is, Tertullian is going to go against a strong reasoning background. And Tertullian is going to go for a faith commitment. Fideism, um, the idea just believe by sheer will. Okay? And so Tertullian has some things he says, oh, some good things. Okay, what does Jerusalem have to do with Athens? Um, in fact, I should just pull that up. That's here. He, he, Tertullian is going to willingly reject all of this that we just saw. I mean, so we just read Felix, the philosophers were Christians. Here's Tertullian. What is Jerusalem to do with Athens, the church with the academy, the Christian with the heretic? I have no use for a Stoic or a Platonic or a dialectic Christianity. And that's, that's excellent, okay? Um, a concept or a theme that I wanna bring out, we'll talk about this in a bit, is an uh, idea that we've already seen with Plantinga, we've seen this in other places. Don't, don't assume to be on the defensive. Okay? There time, comes a time when you stand up and you say, hey, the going creed is folly. This is foolish, and I utterly reject it, and I'm not embarrassed. In its place, Tertullian is embracing paradox. The Son of, of God was crucified. I'm not ashamed. Why would I be ashamed of it? The Son of God died. It is by all means to be believed. And this is where it gets a little troubling, though, because it is absurd. Maybe it's a little bit overstated in the translation. But Tertullian is doing a, a little bit of this. Um, he's doing a little bit of the sheer non, what he would say, uh, non-conformity to reason and non-conformity to the philosophers becomes an argument, powerful argument for Christianity. Here's one other thing I'll just do that I think is, is great in Tertullian. Um, even the pagans accidentally assume a perfect, all-knowing, all-powerful God when they say good God or God Almighty or so forth. Old Testament, only of, this is Tertullian now, Old Testimony of the soul, which is by nature an instinct Christian. Natural instinct is the word, I think. Um, and what this makes me think of, Wayne Grudem has a comment in his systematic theology. He talks about an anecdote where he is in a car and they're having an apologetic encounter uh, they're debating with a girl who's very virulently denying that she believes in God and giving her arguments for it. And so as they're, his story, as they're traveling along and they're making these arguments, something happens like there's a near miss or something. It looks like they're going to have an accident. And she, she blurts out, God, help us. Right. And so then they, they come past the accident and they keep on driving. And then like the car gets quiet because they all realize what just happened. Um, she was five minutes ago arguing there is no God, something happens and she cries out by instinct. And Tertullian's argument is even the pagans who deny God by saying, I think this is fabulous, crying out to a good God or asking for God's help are basically implying that he can do something, right? Because if, if God is in the multiplicity of, you know, lots of different pagan gods, then he can't help anyway. 
Um, and it, it, it's basically, we know, they know better than they admit. Um, it fits a Romans one idea powerfully. It's a suppression because they do know. And they know more than they're willing to confess or concede. Um, here, I'll just, in passing here, uh, one of the issues that came up, and we'll see this is a theme, people will say, if Christianity is true, why do we have more uh, earthquakes and problems and famines? And Cyprian says, well, it's because the world is falling apart. Pause there for a second. We'll come back. Uh, Latin apologists of the fourth century. Okay, here's what you've got to know, though. Fourth century, the great Constantinian turn. Okay, so the story goes, and you've got to know it. It's got to be something you're familiar with. Um, but the story goes, Constantine at some point claims that he sees a sign and the sign is telling him in this sign conquer, it's the cross. And so he decides that he's a Christian after all. And subsequent to that, then he takes, he's baptized, excuse, actually, I think he was only baptized late in the end of his life, but he takes the creed of Christianity. Um, I, I have my doubts that Constantine was actually Christian at all. It probably has to do with political reasons. It's the same reason that American presidential candidates go to church. They don't care. It's just a, a game to play. But the result of this is Christianity moves from the margin into the center. Okay. And if the first, the, the pre 300s uh, Christian church is running and fleeing constantly, okay, post Constantine, the church moves into the cultural center and has all kinds of power, which sounds great. Okay, no more persecutions. Well, actually, persecutions did come back later, but at least it turned the volume down for a little while. Sounds great. Actually, in terms of the health of the church, it was maybe one of the worst things for the church. It was a disaster. And so what I'll put in here, we'll come back to it in a bit, is to say, I, I would view for this era, the first half, the men we've already looked at, the challenge they faced was persecution. Okay? But I would say equally, second half, the challenge these people face is the opposite of persecution. And it's disaster just in another form. Uh, let me introduce these, or we'll talk about these uh, briefly, and then we'll take a break in a little bit. So uh, the result of this, paganism is receding. It's no longer in the center, the pagan cults and so forth. Um, and so you get these kinds of arguments that follow. Because now Christianity is in the center, one of the things they have to start answering is every time there's some kind of flood or famine or earthquake, the argument goes, ever since you aban we abandoned the Roman gods, we've gotten more earthquakes. Um, and so Christianity must be at fault. Now, just a comment in passing. I think this t gives us a little window into the folly of humanity. Um, I have heard arguments in, in our current context to say something like, haven't you seen isn't amazing. There is such a greater frequency of terrible calamities and catastrophe in our day than ever before. And I think that's folly. I think that's, uh, spend some time in Ecclesiastes, you know, there's nothing new under the sun. I think we all in human history have all always thought that our time was suffering more than our predecessors. And the people that come after us will think that they are suffering more than we. This is just humanity. The irony here though, is that even in this era, that's an argument that gets turned against Christianity. His answer to this is there's no proof of this. Um, a proof on the other hand of Christianity, this becomes a recurring theme. Look how quickly Christianity has, ex has expanded. Look at the martyrs who are willing to die. Um, and here, another, like the example I gave earlier, another person who never quotes the Old Testament, rarely quotes the New Testament, barely mentions the Trinity, never the Holy Spirit, never, okay, ready, never discusses the birth and resurrection of Christ. And along with that, you've got some things that are probably basically borderline heresy. So he talks about the death of Christ. The death of which you speak was of the human form assumed, not of his own, of the thing born, not of the bearer. It's called Nestorianism, but it's a kind of form of docetism. Why would he be doing that? Well, Christianity has moved into the cultural center. And so now you've got people that aren't actually dedicated Christians that want to wear the Christian label. And so because it doesn't cost them anything, then they do it. So you've got a person who's probably very ignorant of Christianity. Furthermore, he's trying to make Christianity fit the, the, the philosophical assumptions of his day. And the idea that God would become man in human form and die 
is just unacceptable. Right? It doesn't fit with, fit with Neoplatonism at all. And so his rejection of that is probably directly linked with some philosophical things that are in the air. Okay? So he can't have the real Jesus physically die on a cross. That's no good. People aren't going to like that one. And you've got some things then that are quite deeply troubling. Okay, uh, I'll finish up um, just these guys and Ambrose before we take our break. Uh, I'll skip this. You can look at some of these examples, but some, some interesting things, the Genesis account and citing scripture fulfilled prophecy. Uh, Ambrose is um, an interesting figure, argued for suppressing paganism. Uh, so he's actually saying, you know, let's push, pay, put paganism down now that we're in the center. Um, he asks for toleration because there are many roads to God. Okay. Um, so later, let's have some toleration. And then when you get further out, he actually ends up using um, church power against other groups. And here's what makes Ambrose significant. Little respect for reason. You are commanded to believe, not permitted to inquire. Okay, just hold on to that. This follows the Tertullian pattern, where Tertullian says, I believe because it's absurd or because it doesn't make sense. It's a pattern of saying, in response to other people who will say, I only believe Christianity, and here's the wisdom of the philosophers that helps me get there. Ambrose, Tertullian are going to say, we just completely reject reason as a support or a guide, as an apologetic resource at all. And the result then of this is, is kind of, there's a tension that's developing here. Okay, comment here, I'm seeing it just in the uh, chat, good comments. We're still really reeling from the effects of Constantine today. I agree. I furthermore, though, want to say I do, I think you're exactly right. I think furthermore, there's something deeply human. When, let's say, in American Christianity, the assumption more a couple decades ago, if we can get into the cultural center, then we can get some good things done. That's broken, all right? We really, if we got into the cultural center, it would be a mess. And I think there's something deeper that's going on in our humanity that's not good, uh, a fallen framework. We like to be in the center. <laughs> we like to feel powerful. So there's some stuff that's not good there. Um, so I agree. There's some historical roots. There's also just some us roots that are not good. Uh, and it does seem in this era, the world is more and more confronting uh, Christianity than other religions. There's a comment, one of these apologists in this era will say, will say, why to a Roman prefect, why do you let all these other religions exist? Why just Christians? Why do you feel like you have to kill us? And it's a pretty good argument that that era, there is something that feels like you're picking on this one particular viewpoint in a way that you don't with other viewpoints. Okay, I'm going to pause. We'll take a five minute break. I've got four minutes after. Let me see you at nine minutes after um, and we'll pick it up there. Okay, thanks. Their, knock, their Rock is Not Our Rock. Uh, great book. I highly recommend it if you get the chance to look at it. Um, okay, I'm going to keep on moving just so we can get through as much as we can manage to do here. Um, so that was closing out Latin apologists of the fourth century. And that takes us to Greek apologists of the fourth and the fifth. Here's what I need to do to give you an idea of what I'm, of what's going on. Um, there's a new challenge and the new challenge challenge is Neoplatonism. Um, I said earlier, I think I said Neoplatonism and I, I, sh I shouldn't have said that. Uh, the chronology is off on that. Platonism is what is happening up earlier when other people are trying to conform um, theology. But here, new challenge, Neoplatonism, mainly articulated by these two. And what it is, it's a, it, it is a new statement built on Platonism with some things that are parallel, but some full of, fuller development. Basically, they created a full system that is a competitor for Christianity. And it's very powerful. It's very influential. It, as a, a form of Platonism, is rejecting the beginning, the end of the world, real evil, a bodily resurrection, especially a bodily resurrection is an issue. Historicity of the Gospels, particularly the idea that, that a physical... The idea that God would become physically flesh and live on the earth and then dwell as a human and die, completely unacceptable because Platonism is going to remove the divine so far from the physical, the dirty, the gritty. These things don't go together at all. So these are, these are ideas that are completely antithetical to Christianity. What then is the church's response going to be to that kind of denial? Um, as Eusebius is known mainly as a historian, but he does engage with Neoplatonism. And here's what he ends up doing. 
okay, he is, he is writing in order to confront, at least in theory, Neoplatonism. In the process, he quotes Plato, Porphyry, Plotinus. These are the guys who are in those latter two that are articulating Platonism, Neoplatonism. He quotes them, and most of the time quoting them, he's positive towards them. And the idea, the sense you get is of him kind of soliciting, hoping that by not being too negative on them, you at least can still maintain some of your um, credential. You know, people at least will still listen to you. Uh, he Platonizes the Bible extensively. And so he takes scripture and re reformats, rework, reworks theology in order to be as close as possible. Um, and I'm going to pause there for a second. Um, here's what I want you to, those ideas, okay, just pause there for that, for a second with that. How would I see that expressed in my own day? Okay, what I'm talking about is a kind of apologetic or theological syncretism. Here's the prevailing notions of the day. If you're going to be a credible thinking person, if you're a reasonable person, here's what you have to believe about the world. And so this is the way people are assuming the world works. Um, how do I see then this tendency to be solicitous of that, to be um, pusillanimous, to be weak, to give in, and to try to accommodate Christianity in to make it fit the viewpoint that is our day? Um, put that into our day. Put that into 2018. How am I getting that happening? What's a par 2018 parallel to Eusebius and what he's doing? Anyone? Maybe I didn't give a very clear question. <laughs> okay, the big one would be evolution. Good. Um, so, yeah. Okay. The whole, the whole set of approaches to, uh, the whole set of approaches to origins that tries to accommodate Genesis 1 to 3 in order to make it fit into an evolutionary framework is going to be massive. Um, but to keep on thinking, there's a bunch here. Okay? It's not, evolution is one of it, but one of the things. Um, and so what you're thinking there is scientism. Okay, but think with me for a second. What are the other prevailing notions that are just out there? What, in 2018, what do you have to be in order to be an acceptable, responsible thinking human? Like one of the good guys, not one of the ugly guys. Um, what is the assumption in our world that tells you how you have to be? Okay, take that. And then how is Christianity uh, having to accommodate itself? Genuine, genuineness of belief, no matter the belief. Um, build that a little bit for me because you've got something there. But uh, Peter, if you're able to build that concept out for me a little bit. Okay, good, good, good. Not exclusivistic. Um, and I got this thing, same thing here from Scott, not a bigot. Um, so, I mean, the idea of somebody standing up and, and saying that Christianity, uh, Christianity refuses to accept the LGBT uh, agenda, this, this doesn't, it doesn't work, right? Um, but not just LGBT, I mean, there's, there, are whole, there are whole, you know, parts of belief, all things that you can't say, whole categories of things you, things you can't say. I found myself, I was teaching Bible doctrines recently, and we're doing the church, and so I'm talking about, um, the leadership roles within the church. And just the recognition that the New Testament expects and assumes men in leadership roles. This is the very fascinating. The New Testament expects and demands men in leadership roles. I found something inside of me felt uncomfortable. Like, I, cause I'm talking to you know, lots of ladies in the class. I found myself saying some, feeling uncomfortable with it because I think egalitarianism is deep enough in the spirit of the day that to say, you know, well, so here, pastor, deacon, elder, the New Testament requires men. Feels really awkward. It feels really weird. It feels bad or ugly or something, like I'm the bad part of the world or something. Um, but that's just, it's just there. And we understand you say all kinds of things. There's nothing here about, you know, any kind of superiority. I, I would reject a nation that says because men are, you know, less prone to error or something. <laughs> you look down the list of apologists, they're all men and they're a mess. So I, I'm definitely going to reject those notions. Um, but here's what is happening here is internalizing. I'm internalizing. And so I feel actually a little bit ugly to say something like, 
the New Testament expects that, but it does. Okay. And it will, you realize just that you realize that um, a culture is very, very profoundly powerful. And we have then that desire to try to accommodate what we're doing in our presentations of scripture to not feel like the ugly part of our world. Okay. So before I dig on Eusebius, I put this up too soon. Before I dig on Eusebius for, oh, you know, why don't you just stick with orthodoxy? Realize the way he feels about that is the way that I feel about some of these things. You know, egalitarianism, being fair to everybody, everybody has the same chance. And then, yeah, inclusivism, exclusivism, you guys put in some great things in here. The idea that there would be one view and it's mine and that's the right view. See, I mean, it sounds ugly. Okay. But Jesus, says, he claims and he, that his is truth and he shares with no one. Okay. So, right. And so while I can dig on Eusebius, recognize how, how the pressure is real when you're facing it. Okay. I have to keep on moving. Uh, Athanasius, I thought this was great. I thought it was fascinating. The 70 weeks of Daniel point to Jesus. This comes up later. Other apologists do this too. But hey, we're not the first ones to say this. Um, this is fascinating. He talks about the, uh, just start with the second part of this. He talks about rejoicing that the demons no longer deceive because the cross has conquered. And so the idea here is, because you go all over the Roman Empire and you see Christianity post-Constantine. And so Christianity has been so successful. This shows us the truth of Christianity because it is like taken over the world, at least his, his world. The irony, of course, is as he goes forward, even in his own life, he is going to see that this is not a good thing, that the empire became, quote, Christian. From my standpoint in 2000 or 2018, I look back and I go, whoa, man, yeah, it's not just like Christianity took over the world and that was the end of the story. And so I think what I'm getting here is somebody who's making an argument that makes sense to him in his day, but he should have known better because based on Daniel, based on Daniel, he could have recognized that the, the world is against God and always will be. Uh, same thing from Revelation and so forth. Okay, I'm skipping a couple of others. You can look at this. I'll give you this outline later on. Um, here's, I'll just, this is Theodoret, and just a quote here or a comment here. He freely quotes both scripture and pagan authors together. Okay, he will show that the philosophers often disagree, but he'll also turn around and say that they sound like Christianity. And so basically he'll say they were doing so well. If they had just gone a little further, they basically, they would have been Christian. And the result then is that you end up with a synthesis, Greek philosophy, Christianity, they're going together. The, 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 of course, always result, Christianity is distorted. And the incarnation becomes just a, an appendix. He basically omits Jesus because Jesus isn't going to fit with the, with the philosophers. Okay, and then our last for the patr patristic period and that's good because it's 9, uh, 921, is Augustine. Augustine is huge. Augustine and Confessions and City of God. Augustine is the first, or let's say, it's not the first. Origen has done a complete, like a full, full-blooded, full-bodied systematic theology, if you want to view it that way. But Augustine is really giving an apologetic, going beyond and, and giving more what we would recognize as a complete picture, a complete theological framework. He says things like this, if Plato came back to life, Plato would be delighted to find the churches full of men seeking spiritual and intelligible goods animated by the hope of eternal blessedness. It's again, the same, the same thing, you know, Plato is basically, oh, this, is, this was the goal of my philosophy. Um, here, we're doing a little better though. He, he, Augustine is known for this statement, unless you have believed, you shall not understand, which is the Septuagint version of Isaiah 7, 9. But his idea there is, faith precedes understanding. And so what we're getting here, we've had some people here um, who are more in the mode of kind of a rationalistic, I fit my faith into the philosophers. We've had other people, Ambrose and Tertullian, that go the direction to say uh, that you reject reason entirely and just go with sheer faith. Okay. And what's happening between those two extremes, um, Augustine now is starting to balance and starting to nuance. And we're going to go further with nuance if we get to it. We're going to get much more nuance way later on. Okay, but he's starting to engage the struggle with faith and reason and how these pieces fit together. 
Uh, so he actually ends up setting in a big way the foundation for faith and reason. How do you, how to believe if you are unsure what to believe? So, you know, recognize if you don't know what is truth, how do you just believe it? And the answer for him is the authority of the church. I should not believe the gospel except as moved by the authority of the Catholic church. Uh, later on, he's going to do things like the miracle of the church as an argument, the resurrection. He's going to argue from prophecy. Uh, an interesting little historical piece, when Rome is sacked partway through Augustine's life in 410, it's sacked by a tribe that's coming through. Um, he's, his whole work, City of God, is to say, this is not judgment. This is not because we rejected the pagan gods. Because, and this is a good argument, even before Constantine, he says, there were disasters then too. Okay? So it doesn't prove one thing either way. Okay. I think that's about enough. I'll pause there. There's some other interesting things in here that are fun to read. You could feel free to look that, at that. Um, but general observations now from the entire patristic period. And I'm going to jump over here and put it in a different graphic form. Um, so I'm filling out what we already started to do here, but some other apologetic themes that come up repeatedly with these. Old Testament fulfilled prophecy is a constant thing. Why are they doing that? Because remember who their major opponents are? One of their big opponents is Judaism. And so in the process of answering Judaism, Old Testament fulfilled prophecy becomes a big thing. Um, the philosophers got their wisdom from Moses, and they would be Christians if given the chance. Why would you do that? Because another one of the people you're, groups of people you're addressing are people who have you know, great esteem for the philosophers. So you've got to try to demonstrate that Christianity is, it fits with the philosophers. The moral testimony of believers and martyrs that's a good argument. We can sign up there, okay? Because people have endured persecution, and, and you can see then it was real to them. The miracles of resurrection and Christ, uh, the miracle, uh, miracles and the resurrection of Christ are not important themes, and this is a major weakness. And that takes us down uh, to make, well, one more here, an idea that uh, the catastrophes are not linked to abandoning the gods. That becomes a, a thing that comes up, you know, okay? Since Constantine, since you Christians have taken over, we've had more earthquakes. And what they do here instead is they'll say, they're assuming that the world is getting better and better because, you know, we, okay, Jesus comes, he, he dies, he rises again, he ascends. The apostles go and they spread Christianity all across the Roman Empire. And so within, within a couple of generations, Christianity has spread all across the empire. And then get us out another 200 years after the death of John. And now we're in the cultural center. I mean, it's really fast. Right. And so for them, from their viewpoint at the time, it just looks really triumphalist. It looks like Christianity has won. And so on that, then we can use this as an apologetic. The world is getting better and better. Okay. And you kind of, you just groan inside because you know about the other like 1700 years of human, or not that 1500 years of human history. And you know where the story goes. Okay. But it seemed to make sense at the time. Say that. So weaknesses. Uh, number one, we saw this syncretism with the philosophers, especially Neoplatonism. They're constantly trying to adjust Christianity to fit. Uh, here, after 325, too much confidence in the progress of the church. I'm, I'm connecting this to this, right? They're confident that the church has overcome. And after Constantine, they, they really sh they shouldn't have gone there. And then abandoning the, being the cross and the resurrection of anything that I have on here, this is the thing that has to stick out. The miracle and the resurrection, miracles and the resurrection of Christ are not important themes. They're abandoning the cross and the resurrection. Why are they doing that? That's directly linked to the Neoplatonism thing because you can't have a physical God that doesn't, right? a God who became flesh doesn't work, right? That, you can't mix those two. They have to stay apart. But this is disaster. And if you fit this into what I started with the foundation with the apostles, okay, you get the sense here of just how bad it is because the apostles are always going to go to, like this is the climactic statement. You build your apologetic and the climax is Jesus died. He rose again. He's going to judge the earth. Repent. Okay. And so for this era, for them to kind of pull back on the resurrection is to pull back from the core of apologetics. It's to pull back from the core of the gospel. You don't really have much of a message left at all. This is absolute disaster. Um, here as a, passing point, how would in our modern era, how would we say that, where is the pressure of our modern context against this? 
Okay, because I would suggest the resurrection of Christ and the judgment stand at such a core nexus of Christianity or of worldview that in every era, they're probably going to have ways of pushing back on us. Okay, think for a second, how in our era, and, and, and go ahead in a, in a deep way, the resurrection of Christ and then his, his standing as judge, the result of that. Um, how would this be an unacceptable message to fit within our context, within our world? Comments there in the chat. Okay, this is excellent. Good. No one has the right to judge anyone else. Okay, and even Jesus. In other words, the you think of it in these terms, the idea that even Jesus would stand up and say, you know, well, you were a good Hindu or you were a good Buddhist, um, but that doesn't cut it. That's an unacceptable notion, right? If he was a, quote, good Muslim, then he should be good to go. Um, so the judgment is very, that's very clear. And I think that's fitting into the inclusivism, right? Um, the other direction that you can go here, if you do secular materialism, uh, the idea, yeah, the idea that a physical body would rise again is going to be an unacceptable notion, right? So do you actually believe that he physically died and he physically came back to life again. This is, this is not scientifically plausible. Okay. And I think on both of those points, then to stand up and say clearly that you actually believe he died and rose again. And because of that, he will judge all who disagree or do not accept. and, and uh, put in these terms, who do not bow the knee to him. This is a very unacceptable notion, how to say it in 2018. Okay, uh, that takes us into the medieval era. So let's go there. Um, and Middle Ages, okay. Um, I should pause it just uh, uh, before that kind of a conclusion for this. I think this is this is pretty remarkable. The, re the result of the syncretism was so successful, the pagans themselves found a new Christian Hellenistic synthesis more appealing than the original religions of Julian and the Neoplatonists. In other words, the Christian apologists were able to pull off the syncretism so well that they actually made people like it better than their old paganism. And the paganism faded because the syncretistic Christianity was successful. Well, that's disaster. Right. Because I, I would say this, if people like your theology, as in the public in general, loves your theology and eats it up, I, I'm not going to say absolutely that it's untrue, but I'm suspicious. Like if the public eats up your theology, I'm actually scared. Right. And so the fact that the public at large rejects their paganism in favor of this makes me, makes me think they probably got off. It's, it's probably not good. Okay. Um, so Middle Ages, foundations, medieval, medieval or Europe, the church and Greco-Roman culture are assumed as the same. Furthermore, the church is the only way to remain in the center of culture and society. So time has passed, um, and the result of the passage of time is if you want to be, even in terms, you want to get literacy, the best chance you have, the best shot you have at making it somewhere in life and like being a something, getting literacy training, is to be in the church. Right? And that's another place where uh, Brother John Glass's comment, you know, we're still dealing with the problems. That's kind of, yeah, right? Because post-Constantine now, it's in the, 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 actually with the fall of the Roman Empire, uh, the church, the Catholic church now, we can call it that, is, takes in steps into the power vacuum. So the Roman Empire crumbles, and now the church kind of holds things together. And the result then is, if you want to be anything, this is what you are. And the re then, then the further result of that, and we'll talk about this in, as we go, is that you've got people in that are inhabiting, quote, Christianity, but they're basically just pagans. Okay, so they wear the title of a, a priest or a scholar, but there's nothing actually going on. Concerns of the Jewish era, um, excuse me, of the medieval era, uh, people that they're dealing with, okay? So major opponents, Jews, Muslims, and then here, themselves, an incipient unbelief. What by themselves, what I mean is, um, so actually I need to back up. Jews, why Jews? Uh, you've got Jews that are scattered all, the, all across Europe, Western Europe. Uh, one of the apologists later will say something like, 
If a man does not care for those of his own household, he's worse than an infidel. And so his argument goes, we need to, to address and evangelize the people that live right among us. Jewish people live as our neighbors. So that's a major thing. They're spread across Europe. It's the diaspora. Um, why Muslims? Well, so obviously Islam is popping up 700s and then it's spreading rapidly. But by the time you get, you're getting, certainly by the time you're getting into 900 and 1,000, um, you're going to have the fall of Constantinople. You're going to have Islam encroaching. You're going to have massive mounts, massive influence of Islam all the way in Spain. Okay. And so you've got Islam that's encroaching right into Europe. And from their standpoint, as they're looking at it, they feel like Islam is going to take us over. And so Islam and interacting with Islam is a major issue in, in the Middle Ages going forward. Themselves, um, there's major discussion in the Middle Ages about the, faith, the role of faith and reason. And it becomes a big deal. And I'll, I'll talk about why I have a theory why I think it's a big deal. Uh, but this is a major thing that comes up over again. And then lastly is incipient unbelief. And by incipient unbelief, what I mean is you've got apologists that are speaking for the church and you look at what they're saying and they're not, they're not, ad, they're not articulating anything Christian at all. Okay. And so they will do the theology game and articulate unbelief very skillfully and very powerfully. And, and I think then part of the apologetics that the church has to have or should have had was addressing itself so that in a few cases, you've got good people, a few of them that are doing apologetics against another priest or another scholar. And he, truthfully, he's an unbeliever. I mean, he's, he wears the label, but he's an unbeliever. Okay, uh, some thinkers here. Um, John Damascene, I think this is great. He views Islam as Aryan because Christ is merely a prophet. Um, one way to view Islam is as a really, 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 really bad heretical Christian offshoot. Okay, I'm not calling Islam Christian at all. But there is so much, there are so much root, there are so, so many roots through is, uh, Judaism and Christianity that Islam is like a very distant cousin. There are some things there, and there's, we'll talk about that when we get further on to the Islam section. Um, there are some interesting things here that kind of blow, blew me away. He had a dialogue, this is a different person, but Timothy for the first, uh, a patriarch, had a dialogue with a, 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 a caliph. Uh, it should be Caliph, not Califo. Califo, a Caliph Muhammad al Mahdi in Baghdad. And they have this discussion and they agree on, they say, the Torah, the Gospels, and to some extent the Quran as legitimate authorities. If you pay attention to the Quran, uh, it actually speaks positively of the Torah and parts of the Gospels. And you can use that. I've used that in conversations with Muslims. So he's recognizing some. Um, if you, this is, a, this is a rabbit trail. The Mongols. Okay, Genghis Khan, um, not Genghis, but after Genghis, okay, the Mongol Empire, there's actually a place where they bring in, uh, I think it's a Nestorian and a Catholic and, um, and a Muslim, an Imam, and they have this huge debate, okay, and we're talking the Mongols, so Central Asia. There's some crazy stuff that goes on during this era, era okay, and these people are engaging in some cases in a good way. Uh, multiple argued that the advantage of Christianity is it had not spread by the sword. Obviously, that's a dig on Islam. Um, skipping over a couple here, uh, here during the Carolingian era and the 11th century. So what you need to recognize about the um, Middle Ages, part of the challenges that they have, one of the challenges they have in the Middle Ages is just the sheer dearth of culture. Um, there are parts of the Middle Ages where the sheer brutalness of life, the brutality of life, there we go, um, especially 6th to 11th century, just limits people to abilities to, to survive. Okay? And so you have these little bright points, 8th century, the Carolingian kind of revival. And then by the time you get to the 11th, there's some technology things that come together and they're finally able to feed themselves well and things like that. But people are, people are starving. If people are just, life is short, nasty, brutish. And that limits apologetics because people don't have time to think about it. Um, during other things that are going on is just uh, factors here that people are starting to, because of the Crusades, they're starting to engage with Islam and engage more. 
um, one of the really fascinating dynamics here. So Europe is highly limited, let's say money, okay? Money is a form of this. There's other significant tech, like basic technologies like that, that they don't know anything about, okay? The, the Crusades happen, they go and they're fighting with Islam and the result is they pick up basic wisdom and they, because the Islamic cultures are really advanced and they start bringing some things back and they start rediscovering Aristotle. They start discovering like higher forms of math. They start discovering major technological advances. And the awkward thing about that now is that Christianity is backwards to Islam. They're basically playing a catch-up game. And so the apologists are working with that. The apologists are trying to figure out how to, how to handle that, apologetically speaking. Uh, Anselm is a major, a major figure. Um, and important, very important for discussing the role of faith and reason. His idea is faith enables reasoning. Uh, I do not seek to understand that I may believe, but I believe in order to understand. So this sounds a little bit in the direction of um, Tertullian, right? Um, this sounds kind of Augustinian, but maybe if Tertullian's over here, there's no role for reason at all. It's all just faith. And Augustine's over here, then Anselm is, is in this direction. Um, so he's going to say that you've got to just believe first. Um, and he's going to say things like this that are, okay. Lord, I acknowledge and I thank thee, should be thank, not think, that thou hast created in this thine image in order that I may be mindful of thee, conceive thee, love thee. But that image has been so consumed and waste, wasted away by hives and obscured by the smoke of wrongdoing that it cannot achieve that for which it was made except thou renew and create it alone, create it anew. That sounds like Calvin. That sounds like later thought that's going to say the results of the fall has twisted our thinking, right? And so he's on to something there. There's something that's good there. Ironically, some is, even as he's suspicious of reason, he says, uh, the argument goes, he can still offer sufficient reasons that will explain the Trinity, the incarnation theology. And so basically Anselm, a little naively, has two different ways. Okay, you can get to truth by faith, or you can get to truth by reason. And he's really sure that if you build up the right reasons, and he has the reasons, he can develop theology by reason as well, which is, it's quite um, naive. But people then will view Anselm as maybe being a rationalist or maybe being a phidias, and they're not sure. <laughs> well, it's probably because both of them are true in another way. Abiyard is also, he's very influential. Abiyard is one of these, I think Abiyard is like a medieval era uh, uh, critic, critical theologian, liberal theologian. I mean, in other words, in, in the medieval era, it's not like he can come out and say, well, I don't believe in God. And so this is like liberal theology, but done at the time. Um, and when I look at some of the things that he's saying, I, I, there's no reason to think he's a believer. There's no reason to think he has even, even Christian roots in what he's, the way that his thought is developing. He would be the converse of Augustine. In him, reason can create a kind of faith that opens the door to full faith. And, and so he would say something like, don't even believe until you're convinced. Okay, so if over here Tertullian, just believe and then later figure out reasons. And Anselm is doing a, you know, well, not quite that far, but you know, there are legitimate reasons, but faith is where it's at. And Augustine is going to say faith first, but there are reasons. Then Abiyard is way over here, right? To say, don't believe it unless you have reasons. One who trusts too quickly is light-minded. I mean, he's actually telling people not to just jump in in faith. In his dialogue between a philosopher and Jew and a Christian, the philosopher lament, laments that religion is regressive behind the other disciplines because believers refuse to question the traditions of their upbringing. This is why I say he's like a liberal Protestant back in the, the middle, middle of the Middle Ages because he's, he's, he basically say, well, can we just loosen up a little bit? Can I try some new ideas? Um, he compares the Trinity to mind and world soul in Neoplatonism. He's playing with the Trinity and he's comparing it to a pagan or a, a Neoplatonism, a pagan philosophy. He's bringing together religions and philosophy with Christianity in a way that just destroys Christianity entirely. And here's a, 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 a interesting dynamic. Abiyard versus Bernard. This is, um, Bernard was more orthodox. Uh, 
it symbolizes or recognizes a tension between Christian attitudes that recur in each generation. Uh, uh, an attitude that tries to find as broad a common ground with non-Christian and with every other possibility. That's Abiyard. Okay, so Abiyard is going to reformat Christianity to make it include everything. And Bernard is absolutely committed to strictly dogma, say, this is the faith, this is what the church has taught, don't shift. And Dulles is observing that this tension is ongoing. Okay, now I'm signing up on the Bernard side of things, right? I mean, it's, this is the faith and that's truth, done. And I don't need to accommodate. Um, but some of this kind of dynamic is all the way up into the present. When you think about some of the methods of doing apologetics, try to find common ground and try to adjust, it, we're, it's still with us. This stuff is still there. Okay, um, any comments or I'm, I'm just you know, droning on here, but uh, any feedback that I need to talk about here, I'll pull up chat here for a moment. Right, the Bernard approach would be represented by the Catholic Church today, correct. Um, Abiyard is not, yeah, right. Abiyard would not be, uh, even within his own time, considered acceptable. It, it, there was some significant pushback. Um, there is some neat stuff here. This is Peter the Venerable. This is, okay, it's Catholic. So I'm not saying that, yeah, I'm not saying that I'm, I'm glad for this, but there's some neat stuff here that somebody's getting it. He was deeply concerned about reaching Jews. So in order to actually reach the Jews, a lot of apologetics prior to Peter um, is just an absolute blistering attack, but they don't, maybe, they, they probably don't even understand anyway, okay? So they just, they have their arguments and they're not listening. Peter instead actually works personally with Jewish texts. He works from the Hebrew, he works through the Talmud, and he does that in order to more accurately and helpfully argue that Jesus is the Messiah. Well, that's, that's good. It's incredibly commendable. I think a lesson to be learned here is just to say, um, for instance, I'm right now preparing an apologetics class on the undergrad level for next semester. Okay, one of the things I know I've got to do before I teach that class, I've got to find representatives for each one of the views, and I need to have an extended conversation with each one of the representatives. I've had some conversations here and there, but I have not talked to like a church leader in the INC church. I need to find a guy who will sit down with me and I need to talk to him. No, I'm going to do apologetics with him. I'm going to try to witness to him. But the reality is it's easier to talk at them than to actually understand their view. Okay. Understand their view first in order to better rebuke it. And so to actually take the time to study what's wrong in order to know where you're going to address it. I think there's some wisdom here. Um, he also worked to reach Muslims. And this is fascinating. He was convinced that the Crusades would fail unless they also involved evangelism. So he wanted people to go along with the Crusades as missionaries. Uh, he eventually, he couldn't really study the Quran because he didn't speak Arabic. So he found somebody who could do it and got him to translate the Quran into Latin. And then he went out and wrote a summary of Islamic teaching, basically did like a systematic theology of Islam in order then to be able to refute it. Okay, this guy's working at it um, and, and doing some good things there. Okay, jumping to Aquinas. Aquinas, uh, worth knowing that part of the background for Aquinas is that it's a time of a lot of uncertainty and change. So cathedral schools are fading. They're being replaced by universities. This is the dawn of the university. The mendicant orders are weakening. Augustine is not as influential anymore. This is a big deal. Aristotle is being rediscovered. People are starting, because of Aristotle, they're starting to think more scientifically and less scripturally. And so there, and then one more piece of this, the Crusades have failed in Spain and because of the Moors, Islam has come up in Spain and it's, it's formed up a variant of Aristotelianism, it's kind of a mixture of Aristotelianism with Arab culture and Islam. Islam would, the Muslims reject Averroes. Um, and so that they reject him as a, we're looking at an Islam, Islamic heretic here. <laughs> we're looking at an Abiyard for, for Islam. Okay. Because Averroes is taking, uh, um, he's taking uh, Aristotelianism and kind of trying to mix it with Islam. 
the result of and, and a couple of different things that are unacceptable either to Islam or to Christianity, but it becomes incredibly popular. So averroism becomes this major um, popular notion that's going around in the universities. And as a result of that, the university is very, you know, as they would be today, very progressive. The church is upset and concerned about the spread of averroism and Aristotelianism. Previous to this, the church has been mostly Platonic or influenced by Platonic philosophers. So there's a shift here and there's some stuff going on. Okay, so that brings us to Aristotle. That's background for Aristotle, or excuse me, Aquinas. That's background for him. Aquinas' answer is to refute Aristotelianism, Averroes, or Averroism, by creating a Christian Aristotelianism. So the solution in his mind is, in order to solve the problem of the Arab reading of Aristotle that's so popular in the universities, let's get out, instead of an Arab Aristotle or an Arab Aristotelianism, let's get out a Christian reading of Arist Aristotle. And that can compete then. And a, a comment I just want to make here, um, the solution, and there's, uh, we've seen this already, but we'll see it there's further on. The solution to wrong teaching is never to do kind of a Christian shift or Christian take on the wrong teaching, right? If this is wrong, you answer it with truth always. But the idea that he has here of, okay, if this is the thing I'm combating, let me try to combine Christianity with it somehow, like mix some of the medicine with the poison and that'll be a better, more effective answer, is fundamentally broken. So he's working to give now a Christian take on Aristotle. Since Aristotle is popular, we've got to create a Christian Aristotle. Um, he assumes as a, the, the Summa, Summa Theologica, um, is the, main, the, the massive book that has huge influence in the Catholic Church and in Protestantism until today. It's an incredibly influential book. It's right up there in the top, maybe three books in the history of the church <laughs> after the Bible. It's a huge book. And it's, it's kind of a full bore systematic theology, if you want to think of it like that way. Um, book one, he's going to start with the supposition. Since the Muslims don't accept scripture, I have to use reason. I can't appeal to the scripture and I can't appeal to the church because they won't accept it. So the following step then is there are two levels of knowledge. Basic truths like the existence of God, the end of the world, God's attributes, all of those things are on level, those are like level one knowledge. That's basic knowledge that you can know by reason. Okay, and so I don't have to have revelation to get that. In other words, think of it this way. Plato and Aristotle could have come up with the existence of God, the end of the world, God's attributes, those ones that are listed, eternal, immutable, omnipotent, omniscient. They could have known that just from their reason. Okay, and so that's the level one kind of knowledge. If you want to enter into level two kind of knowledge, that's redemption, that's salvation, and that's going to be the, uh, like the Eucharist, uh, the, that's going to be other aspects of the church. And so that's the higher level of knowledge. So he divides, in order to solve this problem of reason and faith, he divides it into two different levels, level one and level two. And that's a big idea that, again, stretches down through history and all the way down to the present. Um, so truths that reason cannot bring to us, Trinity, the incarnation, the sacraments, the resurrection, that's level two knowledge. That's higher level. You're going to need revelation for that. But even there, he's going to show that reason can kind of support it. Okay. And the result now, if we have our framework for uh, over here on the extreme, Tertullian, and over here, Abiyard, Tertullian, you don't need reason, just use faith. Abiyard, you have to have reason. It's all about reason. Augustine somewhere in the middle. Um, Aquinas is doing something somewhere around the ra range of Augustine, but it's a new form of it. It's dividing it out into two different levels. And so I get to first level by reason, existence of God, and then revelation takes me the rest of the way. Um, and that, that is the most enduring mark of Aquinas, is that distinction between these. Just a comment about Aquinas. Aquinas is in his own day, not really that significant. And it's only until like the 1800s and Vatican I that Aquinas becomes a thing. Okay? So in, even in his own day, he's not, he's not that significant. It's much later in the Catholic Church. 
Uh, just as Clement, Origen, Eusebius, and Augustine had shown the, this is Dulles, wonderful harmony, being, harmony between Christian revelation and the highest insights of the Platonic tradition, Thomas was able to show the capacity of the biblical revelation to absorb, correct, and complete the most brilliant achievements of Aristotle and his Arabian commentators. Dulles thinks it's great. Um, but so what you're seeing here, all of these thinkers that come before work so hard to incorporate Christianity with Plato. And we have a new thing, yeah, with Aquinas doing that with Aristotle. Okay. What's disturbing to, to, the, to me about that is to say, you know, so, wow, the biblical, biblical theology has enough flexibility that it can be moved and shaped and formed. It's plastic. Okay. This is not an acceptable notion to a person that's dedicated to an, an absolutist presentation or assumptions about theology. Uh, a couple of others, I'll just click through these so that we can at least finish out the medieval era. Um, and then we'll hit some of this in our next lecture. Uh, but a couple of these that are missionary apologists that did some fascinating things. Um, here, Raymond Martini is the man who makes the strong effort to address Jews. He did some neat things with arguing from Old Testament prophecy, Daniel 9, 24 to 27, that's the 70 weeks. Okay, he does what we do. <laughs> so in our day, the 70 weeks thing is, is really rejected. It's considered um, controversial, but you see it a bunch in medieval era and back where they're saying, you know, 70 weeks, it adds up and then the Messiah and they used it as a, as a proof. I, I think that supports my view of that passage. Uh, Genesis 49, that's the promise with Judah, Malachi 1, 11. So he's using some of these Old Testament prophets to do this. This Raymond Lull, you can read that, is a crazy story. Uh, he, he was, he got converted and then after he gets converted, he abandons his wife and his children and rest, spends the rest of his day in prayer, um, but not, not in a good way. Uh, it's just a crazy story. Okay, uh, that takes us to late scholasticism. Um, and I'll skip down to Duns Scotus. Uh, Duns Scotus gives 10 reasons that scripture is true, and these sound like they could show up in your local apologetics textbook. Uh, fulfilled prophecies, scripture is internally consistent. Oops. Uh, 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 the writers claim to speak for God. The church was discriminating when they created the canon. Okay, that's a bit Catholic. Scripture records with reason and natural morals. In other words, the morals of scripture are things that we would recognize as a society as good things. Those who reject, it, reject scripture show that their lives are a mess. Um, that again, that maybe would be an argument we wouldn't make, but okay. The church has endured just as Jesus predicted. You know, the, the gates of hell will not prevail against it. The miracles, especially the miraculously fast spread of Christianity, the historicity of Jesus' life confirmed by non-religious authors and the illumination and strength that God gives to faithful believers in the present. Um, I am leaving these, if you want to look at these, just notes that you could look through and I'll, I'll put this up in the uh, Moodle page. 15th century takes us to the Turks now. They're getting further and further into Europe. Fall of Constantinople, which is Turkey, okay, following in 1453. And so the following apologists are gonna be deeply concerned about how to talk to Islam. Um, in some cases you have here, uh, Raimundus Sabundas is, so he's, he's doing some confident, so strongly confident in reason. He thinks he can prove all of Christianity without the Bible or the church. Okay, so he's way over here with Abiyard. Okay, if the faith reason thing is going on, on the far extreme of confident and reason, eventually rejected by the church. Um, Dionysius admired Aquinas, but towards Platonism. So we've got some back and forth things going on. Nicholas of Cusa conceives a world religion. All Hindus, Muslims, Jews, and Christians could get together. And if, if they could all come together and we could find out what things can you give up on and what can, things can you let go of, Okay, and so then we, everybody tells like the doctrines that they have to have and the doctrines that they're willing to let go. We maybe could create a kind of world religion, which he assumes as a Catholic is going to be a deluded Catholicism. Okay, but why I think this is, this is interesting to me is to recognize, you know, the height of the Middle Ages, you've got somebody who's basically like a theological liberal. It's just, it's done in the Middle Ages format. Okay. And I think that's fascinating. This kind of, this sense of uh, liberalism is with us all the way across. Here we've got the, uh, this is the lesson that we saw back with the, um, the fathers. 
argues that the philosophers foresaw Christianity like prophets for the Old Testament. So what Jeremiah and Isaiah were for the Old Testament, Zoroaster and Orpheus and Pythagoras and eventually Plato, they are for the Christian faith coming from another direction. Okay. And so we can just do like the Old Testament prophets and we can do the Greek philosophers and they all end up in the same place, Jesus. So Plato was, get this, Plato was Moses speaking the Attic language. Platonists made use of the divine light of Christianity to interpret their divine Plato. Do you get that? Made use of the divine light of Christianity to interpret their divine Plato. Okay, like Plato is the parallel to Jesus. It, it's, it's awkward. It's bad. Um, all religion is better than no religion. In, in other words, any religion would be better than none. And so God allowed lots of religions the same way he allows lots of like different insects and stuff just so as, for us to have some variety. In other words, Middle Ages, you have some guys that are pretty liberal, okay? And this, this exists all the way in that era. Okay, so that'll take us out. Uh, let's hit just the conclusions or lessons from the medieval era and a couple of things to comment on here. Um, one comment I wanna start with is this. Sometimes the quote apologists are actually unbelievers masquerading as theologians. And I think Abiard is a prime example of that. I want to say an unbeliever or a scoffer may be able to hide themselves, himself as a theologian better than anywhere else. What I mean by that, um, there's a Sherlock Holmes story that's, it's funny. Um, so they're trying to find this document. Somebody's hidden this document and it's a very like a deed or something. It's really incredibly important. And so the, the, uh, the police and, you know, the investigators have gone in and they've taken the home, home apart. They've taken the, all the furniture apart. They've like inserted needles under the carpet. They've just, they've done everything and they can't come up with any, it anywhere. So obviously Sherlock Holmes saves the day. He goes in and um, he finds it in no time. And where he finds it is framed on the wall. And the picture of the story is, um, or the, the concept of it is, sometimes the best place to hide something is in the most obvious place. And I kind of, I've kind of found this personally. You know, so you look at all like the normal places under the couch cushions or whatever, but it might be in the, like, have you done this? You're walking around, you can't find your whatever, your keys or something. And then you find it in your left hand, right? I've done this, it's embarrassing. Um, so this is a real dynamic, okay? I, I want to see some kind of concept like that where an unbeliever, a frank, total, total skeptic is hiding in the most obvious place of all. He's hiding as a theologian, right? I mean, it's the last place you look. Like, you're, where are the enemies of Christianity? And the last place you look would be a theologian, the guy who wears the label. But that's where they hide. Okay, and I, I think that's one of the lessons I get from the medieval ages. The guys who claim to be apologists might be your worst enemies. Sometimes it's not clear who is the enemy and who's the friend. Uh, because actually the guy who's claiming to defend Christianity is tearing it apart. The continuing concern to syncretize philosophies with philosophers leads to massive diversity. And um, I won't comment any more on that, but that's some of the, when you look in the Middle Ages, all these odd directions that people are going at the same time. I think it's this, depending on what philosophy you're trying to syncretize with, you get very different results. This is a big deal because they were actively or they were not actively engaging other worldviews. They lost the ability to engage and to handle challenges. In other words, by not talking to Judaism, not talking to Islam, they don't even know how to talk anymore. And so part of the deadness of the medieval era is that they're not actually being challenged because they're not allowing themselves to be challenged by talking to people that have a different view than they. And this is why... I, th I think it's critical that we do this, um, that we actually, we actually have these hard conversations. And then last, and this is all I'll do and we're done. So I'm, I'm really almost done. Um, this right here, the role of faith and reason, I think is fascinating. We've, I, you know, I've been doing my hands out on the spectrum this whole time. Probably should have drawn a diagram before. But why the role of faith and reason and why this back and forth? Why guys that are saying it's all reason? Why guys that are saying it's all faith and so forth? And I think what's going on here, especially, especially in the medieval area, the tension of faith and reason is tracing back to Pelagianism, the philosopher's syncretism versus authority, the church. 
And what I mean by that is this, if you're working hard to say Plato and Aristotle were able to get to faith, then you have to have a high regard for reason because clearly they weren't dependent on revelation. So in order to kind of pull together Christianity and baptize it and make it work with Aristotle, you have a high view of reason. Okay. And so the guys that are doing that, are, they're going that direction. Reason can get us to the truth. We hardly even need the Bible. We can reason our way to it. On the other hand, the other impulse of Catholicism is to keep on confirming the authority of the church. The church is the ultimate authority. The church is the ultimate guide to truth. If you're going that way, then you do faith, right? Because faith, the question with the faith view is always faith in what? right? I don't just want like, okay, faith is how you get there. Just believe in something, pull a book off a shelf and believe it. No, you have to know what, right? And so the Catholic church becomes the answer to that question. The Catholic church is the answer to what you ought to believe. Okay. Both of these realities coexist in medieval Christianity. On the one hand over here, you're trying to make everything fit the philosophers. And over here at the same time, the church is the absolute authority. And so depending on who you are or which side of that you emphasize more, you might come with widely different answers on how you view faith and reason. So that faith and reason and the role of those is a big deal all the way through the medieval era because you've got to resolve this because you've got two things that are, they're not actually compatible, but they both exist in the Catholic church. And people are trying to find every possible way they can get to try to make these things work or people are taking one and just running with it because they're willing to abandon the other. And I think that's, to me, the key for unlocking what's going on in the medieval era with faith and reason. Okay, well, the advantage I had here was that I, I come back on Thursday. And so I will be able to work with you. We'll talk about the Reformation era, and then I won't go a lot into the, um, the 18th and 19th century, but we'll do that some. So that's that. I will see you back on Thursday. Um, and assignment, remember, I'm putting it up on the Moodle page to go through what does scripture give us for apologetics? Give us some biblical examples of apologetic. Okay, that's it. Thank you all for your time. We'll look forward to seeing you next time. See you on Thursday.